Good day. It's uh, good to be here with you again, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to uh, share uh, with you um, uh, the scripture today from chapter 6 of Ephesians, and as we work through that material, hopefully uh, you will be uplifted and encouraged and uh, ready for the upcoming week ahead. Um, so we are nearing the end of the sermon series Ephesians Blueprint. We have this message and one more to go, and then we'll be moving into hopefully uh, maybe within a month or so into a new a new series. Uh, there'll be some other messages coming along the way, but we'll see how that goes. So again, thank you for having me in your places, and uh, why don't we begin? It's interesting. Uh, I found uh, the results of a survey, and for us nerds uh, who like uh, numbers and figures and all those sort of things, this might be kind of intriguing. And for others, I would just ask for your patience. I'll try to be as uh, swift as I can through this material uh, in the introductory comments here. Um, Barner Research Group, back in 2009, released uh, some findings of a nationwide survey of adults' spiritual beliefs. And this was done in the States, so if you're, not, if you're from the States, it's probably more applicable to you than it is to maybe others. But I, I'm really convinced it's not far removed from us here in Canada, too, in the Christian culture. Anyways, the survey revealed that American Christians have what the researchers said, quote, a diverse set of beliefs. And, the really, and it's interesting to note that the, the research revealed that, a number of, uh, that there was a number of beliefs, with all these numbers of beliefs, or these diverse set of beliefs, there were some contradictory issues, some inconsistencies. The survey asked specific questions about God, about Jesus Christ, uh, Holy Spirit, Satan, and demons. And for our purposes today, we want to look at what the survey revealed concerning the beliefs about Satan, demons, and the Holy Spirit. Now keep in mind, this is a survey. It is 14 years old, but nevertheless, there's some interesting things coming out of this survey. Now Barna's four-point opinion scale found that uh, four out of 10 Christians surveyed strongly agreed that Satan, quote, is not a living being, but is a symbol of evil. That's very interesting to note. Additionally, out of this group, two out of 10 Christians surveyed, that is 90% of that group, said they agreed somewhat with that viewpoint. But there's only a minority of Christians surveyed in this particular uh, subject that they b believe that Satan is real, or a, a small group that believe that Satan is real by disagreeing with that statement. And it's, and it's interesting to note, this is where the inconsistency, inconsistencies come in. Pardon me, um, I'm kind of running out of words today. I already preached this earlier today. The, the contradictory things that came into this place revealed that Christians believed that they could be under the influence of spiritual forces, such as demons or evil spirits. And the majority of Christians surveyed agreed that such an influence is real. And just three out of 10 rejected the influence of supernatural forces. Well, we move on. Similar to the perception of Satan, most Christians in this survey do not believe the Holy Spirit is a living entity. Um, it's not the third person of the Trinity. 20% agreed that the Holy Spirit is, quote, a symbol of God's power or presence, but is not a living entity, end quote. And one third of those Christians disagreed with the majority view of this majority view and said that the Holy Spirit is a third person of the Trinity, and about 9% were not sure. Again, we find some inconsistencies here with the majority view of the Holy Spirit. Around 49% of those who agree that the Holy Spirit is only a symbol, not a living entity, believed and agreed that the Bible is fully accurate in all of the principles it teaches. Even though the Bible clearly teaches the Holy Spirit is more than a symbolic reference to God's power and presence. It's very interesting. Now the question before us is this. What can we deduce from Barna's 
findings. What can we say about these findings? I think, first of all, in principle, uh, I would agree, and maybe you would too, that their initial finding of the survey revealed a diverse set of beliefs. We've seen that just in these few moments. But there's another question here. How did the respondents, those in the survey, come to their conclusions that the survey revealed regarding Satan, demon, and the Holy Spirit? Because it's clear when it comes to Barnabas' findings concerning Satan, demons, and the Holy Spirit, as diverse as they may be, we can also deduce that this points to an observable lack of understanding and knowledge of the orthodox biblical teaching concerning Satan, demons, and the Holy Spirit. A fellow by the name of Pastor Burke Parsons, who uh, contributed to DesiringGod.com, uh, an article said this, quote, Some have said that the devil's greatest trick is convincing the world that he doesn't exist. C.S. Lewis, I'm sure you're familiar with who C.S. Lewis is, at least in some way. He once said this about this subject, quote, If you haven't met Satan recently, you are probably going his way. Very interesting statement. Now the Apostle Peter in his uh, first letter, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, said this concerning the subject. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Well, my friends, please turn in your Bibles to chapter 6 of the letter to the Ephesians. And we'll pick it up in verse 10 and go to verse 20. Chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts or flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Verse 19, and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Please join me in prayer. Our Lord and God, we thank you for your word. And as we look at this uh, particular uh, set of verses in chapter 6 of this wonderful letter to the Ephesians, O oh Lord, help us to, um, by your spirit, to unpack it, what it really uh, kind of, what it means and what, and what its implications is for us and for the church and for the world around us. And help us to be, make it as practical as possible in our own lives. And uh, in that way we can work out what this means and actually live it out in our day-to-day -day lives as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul uh, begins this final section of his letter with this word, finally, here in verse 10. So up to this point, Paul had spoken of the great purposes of God in Christ that is found in his gospel, the gospel of Christ. We see this in chapter 1, verse 13, where Paul said, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Keep that in mind as we're dealing with uh, demonic uh, and spiritual warfare. Moving on, Paul would then, with apostolic clarity, uh, proclaim the glory of Christ in the gospel. We see this in chapter 1, verse 6, where Paul said, To the praise of his glorious grace. That's Christ's glorious grace. 
And it was by the grace of God that the Ephesian believers were saved through faith. Chapter 2, verse 8. And it's from this great salvation that now uh, Paul then went and laid out for the Ephesians what life in Christ should look like, if you can remember that. Uh, Paul said in place, as those of us who have served in the military would say, the arcs of fire. That is, the way of life for a follower of Christ. In the personal life of a Christian, life in the corporate body of Christ, in the fellowship of believers, and in those closer circles of family life and ties. And with all that said, Paul from verse 10 here in chapter 6 to 20 reminded the Ephesians that their life in Christ will not and cannot be lived without engaging in a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare. Well, I want to go back to Pastor Parsons' article and his thesis. And his thesis goes something like this. Par Parson proposes that while true believers know Satan exists, many have entertained the belief that spiritual warfare is not a huge deal. Now, of course, he's speaking, I think, in the Western culture, the Western Christian culture, the 21st century. For Parsons, uh, he would say, it's a matter of Christians then walking by sight, not by faith, when Christians fall into Satan's deception of thinking that he's not really there or uh, he's not actively involved in anything or they, they them, Christians themselves, are not important enough to be a target. But here's the question. What do you, what do I believe about Satan and about spiritual warfare? So let's take a look now and see what Paul had to say to the Ephesians concerning this subject. As we start, I want you to notice with me that Paul, right from the get-go, even before he provides details, and points the Ephesians to the source of their spiritual strength. And please read again with me verse 10. Finally, he says to the Ephesians, and to you and me today, be strong in the Lord and in the strength and in the strength of his might. Well, there's two things happening here. First, Paul gives a word of encouragement. We see this in the phrase, finally, be strong or be strong. We see this encouragement elsewhere in the text that follows. For example, in verse 11, Paul would say, to stand. And then in verse 13, there's two phrases there, to withstand, to stand firm. And finally, in verse 14, stand therefore. These are words of encouragement to the Ephesians, believers. And one can only imagine what they were up against in that uh, city that was well known for its idol worship and prostitution and all sorts of things that would have really kind of forced them to deal with some very uh, important spiritual issues, as it is in our culture today. Please notice here in verse 10, be strong, uh, that phrase, well, this is a verb, it's an imperative, that is, it's a command. And in the original, it means, quote, to make strong. So we could uh, say it this way. We could say ver this part of the verse this way. Uh, Grow strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Second thing, notice who has the power. My friends, who has the power in the world today? Who really, truly has the power? Because it wasn't the Ephesians. They would have said, well, the Romans or somebody else. It's certainly not you and me. And we'd probably say, well, no, it's not me. Maybe it's uh, the country's the biggest armies. But listen to what King David uh, said and how he put it. King David said, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 27, 14. Paul said to the, the church at Philippi, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. And in Paul's letter to his dear friend and fellow pastor, co-laborer Timothy, Paul said this, I thank him who has given me strength. Who's the him? He went on to say, Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Here's the point, my friends. You see, as believers, as followers of Christ, who have been given the Holy Spirit. Paul even talks about that earlier in his letter. Without God, the Holy Spirit, we will not be able to stand against the schemes, the wiles of the devil. Verse 11. 
Without the whole armor of God, we will not be able to withstand in the evil day. Verse 13. And one, might, one might wonder what is the evil day. Every day brings some evil into our lives. And as we move through our text, our approach here will be threefold. We'll look at the enemy, the warfare, and the armor. Let's start with the enemy. And I want to begin with, the, with what I'm calling the enemy from within. And I will explain. Paul here deals specifically in these text, in these verses 10 to 20, with, with the enemy from without. But I want to talk about the enemy from within, which Paul has already addressed earlier in the letter. Let's go back to chapter 2. You can flip your, flip your Bible uh, over to chapter 2 of Ephesians. Paul there had reminded the Ephesians, as he reminds us today, that at one time they were dead in the trespasses and sins. They were dead in their trespasses and sins. Chapter 2, verse 1. That they had walked according to the course of this world. Chapter 2, verse 1 again. They were marching to the drumbeat of their world, their culture, just as many today do in our culture. And they had followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Chapter 2, verse 2. In other words, they had followed Satan, who continues to work in all who deny Christ to this day. And, and, and Paul talks about this in his letters, that they had been blinded, uh, spiritually blinded from the truth of the gospel. And then Paul, in chapter 2, moves to the per plural personal pronoun we. Because it wasn't just the Ephesian believers, it was Paul and the Jews and the Gentile, all of them, and includes all people today. He would go on to say, all of us at one time lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind. Chapter 2, verse 3. And all of us were at one time by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Chapter 2, verse 3. You know, one of the most unpopular things to preach in contemporary Christian circles, in evangelical circles for sure, and others as well, is the wrath of God. People don't like to hear that, especially Christians. And that's pretty, pretty uh, disconcerting when you consider that the Bible talks about the wrath of God in the Old and New Testament as well. And one day the wrath of God will be visited upon this planet when Jesus returns upon all those who have not received the gospel and not accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's just what the Bible teaches we see that Paul in his Roman letter sets the matter straight concerning the Jews who, who had said to him that, uh, that they relied on the law for their righteousness, as he did at one time when he was a Pharisee. They would rely on the rules, the law, which really was intended to point to the sinful nature and the sin in the life. And Paul would go on to say that both the Jews and the Gentiles were under sin. That there is, according to Romans 3, verse 10 and 11, no, none righteous, all have turned aside. No one seeks after God. And Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Now, of course, in the Ephesian letter, Paul here is addressing something that the spiritual condition of the Ephesians were before Christ. Before the Ephesians were what Paul would say, made alive with Christ. In other words, saved through faith alone. Chapter 2, verse 4 to 9. And what an amazing grace that God is offered, God offers the world through his son. That while we were running the other direction from God, deserving the wrath and judgment of a holy and just God, that he would send his son to the earth, that he would die on the cross for our sins, once for all, past, present, and future, for the sin of the world, that we would receive that and believe that and trust in Christ and his vicarious death for us, that we would receive uh, eternal life, forgiveness of sin and righteousness, and justification before a holy and just God. What an amazing, amazing grace that God offered the Ephesians and Paul and us today as well. So you're probably maybe thinking now, well, with all that amazing grace, what's this thing about the enemy from within if we are saved by grace through faith alone? Well, let's go to Paul's letter to the Galatians. You can flip there if you want. 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul there exhorts the believer, exhorts the believer, the believers to walk by the Spirit. He said, walk by the Holy Spirit. Why would he say that? Well, it continues, so that they would not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep us from doing the things you want to do. Galatians 5, 17 to 18. No, isn't that true? Who is the enemy from within? Well, John, in his first letter, chapter 2, 16, puts it this way. The enemy from within are these things. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. These desires remain with every believer even after salvation, even, after, even during the sanctification process until their death or Jesus returns. That's so what the Bible teaches. And the devil uses those desires of the flesh. He corrupts those things or attempts to corrupt those things, the desires of the eyes, and of course, our pride. Our pride, our selfish human pride can become a real, real stumbling block. So it's from these internal uh, desires, this enemy from within, we can now address the enemy without Satan and his demons. Uh, and, the, and the world system as well. Let's look at verse 12. Let's read that together. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the forces of evil in the heavenly places. Well, time's not our friend. And uh, so I, I just want us to consider two points from this verse. You should study it yourself and, and get a, a deeper, deeper study out of it for yourself. Uh, two points I want to share. One, our spiritual struggles in this life, spiritual warfare, spiritual battles, are not against flesh and blood, verse 12. They're not against people. They're not against other people. Yes, of course, uh, people will oppose us. We don't get along with everyone. That is, I, we understand that. I understand that. You should understand that for all sorts of reasons. And sometimes we're opposed because of our faith in Christ. Yet Paul couldn't be more clear, my friends, that our struggle is against the forces of evil in the heavenly places. Verse 12, the heavenly places. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So what Paul is doing in this test, he describes the forces of evil. And he describes the forces of evil located in the heavenly places. And they have authority. And these spiritual forces rule over this present darkness. It's all there in the text for us. So what was Paul describing here? Could, could this be what, my, what some might say a myth, a legend, or some ancient for, folklore? Because after all, we live in the 21st century. We're more enlightened. We, we have science. We have plenty of knowledge. I think sometimes we have so much knowledge we're stupid. Isn't this the stuff of monsters and goblins and ghosts and witches and all that kind of stuff? Well, the answer to these questions is our second takeaway from verse 12. Satan is the devil who presides, and that's what Paul is teaching us here, over many fallen angels, in other words, demons. Please notice the phrase, cosmic powers, verse 12. Now, the NIV, the 1984 NIV, translates the Greek here as, of this dark world. The NASB, 1995, the world forces. And all of these translations, in part, describe Satan and his demons as Paul has already described here for us as demonic beings who rule over this present darkness. Verse 12. Verse 12. This uh, uh, cosmic powers, this cosmic powers is what we need to keep in mind. My friends, Satan rules over, as Paul uses this language in other, another uh, text of his, dominion of darkness. We see at the beginning when he's talking about the Ephesians who at one time were 
uh, far from God and they, and they were in the dominion of darkness. Now they've been brought near to God through Christ and they now are in the kingdom of light, the dominion of light. And here it's often referred to in the original language as cosmos. Cosmos is that, that, that um, it's all about the space, the creation space. It's the cosmos, uh, the, the natural and the supernatural. They, Satan rules over that space. Which, as we already said, the Ephesian believers at one time belonged. And if you are a Christian, you at one time belong. And Satan here works against believers by using the world systems. The world has systems in place and he has his people in that world system. And he uses that over and against the believer and in the church. So the question is, how does Satan do this? How does Satan uh, use these systems that he rules over in the spiritual dimension, spiritual world? Well, a survey through the Old Testament and New Testament reveals, uh, really, as we look at Satan himself, the deceptive nature of Satan and his demons. My friend, Satan is a master deceiver. He's a trickster, supreme trickster. We see this in the Garden of Eden when Satan deceived Eve by questioning her, questioning her understanding of God's commands. Uh, Paul, in his second letter to Corinthians, was dealing with, uh, first Corinthians and second letter, was dealing with false apostles. And he calls these false apostle, apostles deceitful workmen who disguise themselves as apostles as Christ, who disguise themselves as servants of righteousness in the church. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen to 15. Yet these false apostles, uh, false apostles, these false teachers, the Apostle Paul would go on to say, we're only doing what Satan does. And he says in that letter, oh, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He is a master deceiver, a trickster, and, and that, that's something that we need to be aware of. And not only is Satan the deceiver, he's also described by God the Son, Jesus Christ himself, as the father of lies in John chapter 8, 44. My friends, when Satan speaks, Jesus said he lies. He lies. He speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar, John 8, 44. Satan opens his mouth and he lies. Now we could say more about Satan, but I think it's sufficient for our time here today to realize that what we have briefly said leads us to spiritual warfare that Satanist demons, with the help of his human agents, brings against the believer and the church around the world. And how does he do this? With lies and deceits, deceitful things and accusations. Satan often, as someone once said, engages in blackmailing us. You know, with those quiet accusations, Satan whispers his deceitful lies in, into our ears. He says things like, your dirt file, someone else said this, your dirt file is growing. Uh, what, what, what if the church knew about your hidden sin, Tony? What would your spouse say? What would your family say? Or maybe he whispers, you deserve better than him or he. Or, or possibly it's not your fault, it's their fault. And it's like this, day in and day out, the lies, the accusations, the, the deceitfulness continues. And my friends, the question is, what is the end goal for the believer, for the church? And I don't want to pull any punches. Satan wants your destruction and my destruction. He wants to destroy you and me and our families and the church. And so to say that Satan hates, Satan hates believers would be really an understatement. But you know, we should be grateful. We should be thankful that God has not left us to our own devices. Let's read verse 13. Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. So God has provided for you and me protection from the enemy of our souls. But let's remember where we started at the beginning of this message. Where do we find our strength? In the Lord. 
in the Lord. Jesus said to his disciples as he was preparing them for his uh, upcoming arrest and crucifixion and death, he said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. My friends, it's because of our union with Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that we have that we can employ, that we can use, if you will, the whole armor of God. Someone once said this, quote, Armor in place, firm in faith, we may resist the devil, he will flee from us. Verse 14, we might as well start right at it, guys. Verse 14 gives us the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Jesus said to the disciples in John 16, 13, Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. My friends, the world system, as we learned, is under the uh, power of the deceiver and liar. And we know there's truth in the world, but man, can it ever be confusing. Just take a look at our culture today. Very confusing for all of us. So the question that we need to ask ourselves, what is truth? What is truth? This is a crucial question, especially now in the Western culture and in the Christian church today. What is truth? Well, we can answer this. The word of God is truth. Absolutely. We know that Jesus is truth. But the question is, do we accept this? Are we even obeying the word of God? Are we even obeying the word of God? Well, along with the belt of truth, we have the breastplate of righteousness. Here in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul reminds uh, the Ephesians, as he reminds us today, to be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. Why? Because you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Chapter 5, verse 7. Look carefully, then, how you walk. Be filled with the Spirit. Chapter 5, verse 8 and 15 to 18. And in his Roman letter, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 10 to 12, Paul said, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. As believers, as followers of Christ, we pursue uh, holiness and purity. We mortify the flesh. We, we say no to the flesh, the desires of our flesh, no to the lust of our eyes, no to the pride that we can so whelm up in us, a sinful pride. And we ask the Holy Spirit to help us, to strengthen us. And, and we look at the Bible and we understand the truth of the Word of God and we apply that to our lives and to our churches and to our families and to our world around us. So the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, now we have the, uh, what Paul would say in verse 15, as shoes for your feet. As shoes for your feet. What goes on your feet? Well, friends... Have we not come to believe in the promise of the gospel? It's called the gospel of peace here in verse 15. That's the shoes for your feet, the gospel of peace. And friends, think about it. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have received peace with God. Prior to that, God was our enemy. God was our enemy. But we have insurance and peace in our lives, in the middle of spiritual warfare, in the middle of our lives, whatever is going on around us in the world, we have peace with God because of the gospel. And because of the gospel and that we have peace with God, should we not also go tell others about this great and amazing grace of God that is found in the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ? Well, next in verse 16, we have the shield of faith. The shield of faith. My friend, days in, day in and day out, Satan and his agents tempt believers with all sorts of things. Doubt and guilt. And one of, the, one of the ones that I think we all struggle with, I know I have, is the temptation to give up. Because spiritual warfare, living the Christian life uh, honestly and as best we can in the power of the Holy Spirit, 
believing the word of God, studying the word of God, and, and, and living it out can be so hard sometimes. For there, like I said, many things against the world, the world and the devil and all sorts of things against that. And the temptation is to give up. But friends, faith in God and his purposes and will for us by believing the truth of the word of God and by doing what's right in the sight, Paul tells us we'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield of faith. The shield of faith will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. All the lies, all the temptations. And next we have the hope of salvation. The hope of salvation, uh, Paul put it this way in his Roman letter, chapter 1, verse 16. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And the metaphor for that is right here in verse 17, the helmet of salvation. One must have the helmet of salvation. One must be saved in order to be able to deal with the devil. Last, but most effectively, we have the offensive weapon that we can use against the wiles and schemes of the devil, against the lies and deceits and temptations of the world. We have what Paul calls here the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Right here, your Bible, that is the offensive weapon. It is truth versus lies. It is life versus, versus death. It gives us the way to live our lives every day. And we should use the Holy Bible specifically and purposefully in all of life's situations. For the Hebrew, the writer to Hebrew of the Hebrew letter said this in chapter 12, verse 4. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4. Isn't it wonderful? As you think about this, yes, the adversary is very, very powerful. He's not omniscient. He's not all-powerful. He's not God. But thanks be to God in his mercy and grace, that God has given us the whole armor of God. And so with this in place, as we do this on a daily basis, we must, we need to go on, as Paul said here, to pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication for ourselves and for all the saints. Verse 18. How do we employ this armor of God? How do we use this armor of God? We pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication for all the saints and for all people as well. So we have the enemy from within, the enemy from without, the ongoing spiritual war and battle, and the provision of spiritual armor, all in this text. And my hope and prayer for you and for me is that we take up the whole armor of God and stand firm. We face head on the spiritual enemy and spiritual battle before us. And when Satan and the world come against us, may we say with Martin Luther, who said so long ago, quote, I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered, for I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, O oh Lord, for Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the armor of God. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Bye.